Um, good afternoon, everybody. Hope you guys are enjoying reInvent. Uh, my name is Thilena Gunasingha. Uh, I work for McDonald's Corporation. So we are here to talk about how we at McDonald's use ECS to massively scale our home delivery platform. Right, let's get right to it. So we'll talk a bit about uh, McDonald's and our home delivery solution, uh, but most of the time today will be spent on really how we achieve these things like scalability, uh, speed to market, security, DevOps, and monitoring. So here's some interesting facts about uh, McDonald's. Um, we have 37,000 restaurants um, spread across 120 countries uh, globally, uh, and we proudly serve about 64 million customers every day. Right? Um, as you know, scalability is a difficult problem, but scalability with a distributed network like this, as well as this level of uh, volumes in terms of scale, is even a tougher problem for us to solve. Right? We'll talk a bit about that as we go on. Here's some of the velocity accelerators that we at McDonald's use, uh, number one being our digital transformation. Uh, the whole premise of our digital transformation is to make it more convenient uh, as well as personalized for our customers, to make the whole experience personalized. Uh, the second pillar is delivery, again, drawing on that convenience theme. Uh, how would we deliver our food to you when you want to uh, have our food? Right? And then the third aspect is um, the experience of the future. This is to actually elevate the restaurant experience and modernize the restaurant experience for our customers. Right? So let's um, get to the home delivery solution. This is uh, where we used ECS to really scale. Um, we think of this as you as a customer going to something like Uber Eats and ordering McDonald's food for delivery. Right? So that's kind of the uh, business uh, problem and use case. Um, as we work with multiple delivery partners in the world, uh, here in the States we use um, Uber, um, Uber Eats, and in European countries we have other partners, Asia countries we have furthermore partners, right? Uh, we've used a generic experience flow for you to walk through the user experience. It starts by basically you uh, picking up uh, a restaurant uh, to order from. Then uh, you obviously browse through the menu, right? Um, and I've used our signature crafted sandwiches here to illustrate. And then you basically uh, complete your order, build your order basket and complete your order, right? At this point, uh, the order is complete. And then the, when the delivery rider or driver is close to one of our restaurants, the order gets um, released to the restaurant because we believe in uh, making our food fresh as much as possible, as well as uh, giving it to then to the driver to be delivered to you. So that's kind of the whole business problem that we're going to talk about. So what were some of the critical business requirements for this, right? So um, Othra mentioned about uh, speed to market, right? So uh, this was actually a four-month duration for us, and that's from going from a idea to a concept to development to massive scale, right? And that's kind of the new norm um, that we see every day, right? Scalability and reliability, uh, 250 to 500,000 transactions. And the notion of peak hour for us happens three times a day, every day, right? Because you got to eat, there's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? Um, and to put this in perspective, this 250 to 500,000 transactions per hour translates to about 20,000 transactions per second. Right? Um, so that's kind of the scale that we're talking about here. Multiple country support, um, as I said, there's different countries have different business requirements, business rules, and then also different delivery partners, such as Uber Eats, right, to work with. So the platform had to do that. Um, and then finally, the cost sensitivity, right? So um, again, we're not talking about selling big screen TVs here. You're talking about an average check size of about 3 to $5, as low as that, right? So cost sensitivity is a pretty uh, big thing for us as well. So we're going to spend a bit of time on our architecture. So this is a under the covers look uh, of our architecture. Let me see here. So the experience that we went through starts here, which is the third party delivery um, platform, right? Um, so think of this like Uber Eats, right? Then uh, all our APIs are hosted through what's called an API middleware, right? This is consistently using uh, the API gateway pattern, right? Um, these are all REST APIs. 
that's then wired through ALBs to ECS, right? And as you can see, ECS is the heart of uh, the solution. Within ECS, we have multiple microservices. For illustration purposes, we've used two, right? Um, but it's important to understand that these microservices also have different scale and runtime profiles, right? So for example, some services that are customer facing will have uh, tremendous scale, tremendous reliability, um, tremendous performance requirements, right? Because it's front facing, you're hitting that 20,000 TPS all day long, right? Um, some services could be more like about complex event processing type scenarios where workload optimization is uh, what's important. As Uthra mentioned, um, you could use different uh, scale profiles using the auto scale policies, uh, and CloudWatch alarms would trigger the auto scale policy, as well as uh, you could use things like task placement strategy to further optimize, right? And we will go into a bit more detail about how we did that to achieve that scale. Obviously, the order goes to the restaurant, right? And then behind the scenes uh, for eventing, we use SQS, right? So think of this as one service wanting to talk to the next service, right? Through an asynchronous pattern, we use eventing exclusively for that, right? Uh, and it's not just about scale, it's also to be uh, highly responsive and performant, right? Um, to do that, you need to have a lot of things in memory, right? So we use uh, Redis as our distributed caching platform, right? Um, and it's actually hosted through Elastic Cache, right? So um, that's how we really hit those uh, transaction volumes at about 100 milliseconds or lower, right, for each call. And then, obviously, um, it cannot only be on memory, so you have RDS backing Redis up, as well as S3 uh, for some of the uh, more unstructured data. All right, so that hopefully gives you an idea about our architecture and how we achieved some of these uh, big volumes, such as 20,000 TPS. So what were some of the principles that we used, right? Um, again, microservices um, is... Uh, this is not going to be a talk about microservices, but here's some uh, principles that we use, right? Having your clean APIs, right, uh, was number one. Then uh, having a good service model behind that API uh, was number two, right? And then, um, then it depends on what level of isolation you require, right? Um, so your data model to be isolated, as well as your deployments to be isolated so that each microservice can be uh, deployed independently, right? So getting your microservice strategy is critical for containerization, right? And then uh, once you get the containerization right, orchestration of that containerization is very important uh, to massively scale, right? And um, this is where a platform like ECS shines because you get most of them uh, out of the box. We also made a conscious decision to uh, use most of our um, platform services from AWS. This is rather than you maintaining your own database cluster or you maintaining your own caching cluster, right? Use these services because they're scalable out of the box, right? So that was a conscious decision that we made. And finally, for the developers and software engineers in the room, right, um, your programming model, right? Uh, if you are, again, having a highly critical customer-facing uh, microservice, use a synchronous programming model, right? If you are having a complex event processing type scenario, use an AC programming model, use that programming model to build your microservice and then containerize, right? That will save you uh, a lot of time. All right, so let's go under the covers and really hit um, some of these things, right? So we're, talk we're going to talk about um, speed to market, right? How we achieve that scalability and reliability. Uh, what type of task placement strategies or auto scaling policies did we use, right? We're going to get into the meat of that. Security is all about, you know, um, reducing your blast radius and attack vectors, right? So how did we do that at the container level as well as at the service level, right? Uh, finally, we'll talk about um, DevOps. Uh, how did we integrate our DevOps pipeline, uh, which was based out of Jenkins, um, and then also monitoring. Once you take it to production, how do you monitor significantly? So let's get right to uh, speed to market, right? We talked about the four month. It's not just about the four months, though, right? It's about also showing progress to back to your business, right? Uh, in this case, how do we build this continuously and show progress? And we had like two week dev iterations for this, right? Uh, where ECS and containers really help is you could really have your dev containers then go to staging, show progress um, to your business users very rapidly, right? So that was one of the uh, big premises of this, right? 
Then the second thing is the polyglot tech stack, right? So you're bound to have code that's written in different languages, right? So in our case, we have some code in .NET um, and some code in Java, right? Some of this might be legacy code that you need to port over, right? Some of this might be like Java's better than .NET for certain things, right? Um, but in the good old days, you have to like do native integration from .NET to Java, right? But the beauty of uh, something like containerization as well as ECS is now you could host it in two different containers, right? And make the two containers talk to each other through an API, right? So that was also a pretty big benefit to achieve speed. Um, the simplified ECS deployment model, Uthra went through that in detail, so I'll skip that point. Um, here's another important thing, right? So typically you, as good developers, we all write code, right? And then um, we basically do a level of testing, do a level of performance testing, right? And then take this massive cycle of integration and scaling. Right? So to hit these volumes normally it takes a long time, right? But the good news is if you containerize this right and use ECS and the correct um, auto-scaling and task placement strategies, we almost got this uh, out of the box, right? So this was a pretty significant point for us. And then finally, the DevOps integration, um, uh, ECS integrating with our DevOps tool chain very easily really helped us, right? So that's speed to market. Next, we'll talk about scalability and reliability. So I'm going to introduce uh, one of my solutions architect, um, Manjeeva Silva. He's going to talk about um, not only uh, scalability and reliability, but also security and also DevOps, as well as uh, he'll end with some real-world container problems that we had to face and overcome right, to scale to this level. Manjeev? Thank you. So, uh, I'm Manjeeva Silva. Uh, so let me, for the next few uh, slides, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, run through uh, how we use ECS as well as other uh, AWS features to achieve the non-functional requirements. Right? So let's start with uh, scalability and reliability. So as Tilda mentioned, we got, the, uh, we got the scale targets to achieve 250 to 500,000 orders per hour with about 100 millisecond response time. So how we achieve this by using uh, Auto scaling with uh, which ECS provides out of the box, right? As Uttra mentioned, right? You just have to configure the uh, the policies uh, for the auto scaling, and it will uh, work. So uh, ECS auto scale will provide two levels of auto scale. Uh, one is for the ECS, uh, the EC2 layer, which will scale your EC2s, and the second layer is to scale your TAS. So how we approached this was we initially did some performance test uh, to run some load to mimic our production to identify what is our production load is going to look like. Because this is really important, you need to know uh, how is your load is going to look like uh, in the production. So with that, we were able to derive the uh, attributes or the uh, thresholds for those uh, auto-scaling policies. So then we uh, configure the EC2 auto-scaling policies as well as the container auto-scaling policies. And also it's very critical to get these uh, values corrected because otherwise you will have some issues when you are scaling out as well as scaling in. So it's pretty important to get that corrected at the first time. Uh, so once we done with that, you know, we were able to achieve the, the targets, right, to uh, 250 to 500,000 uh, uh, orders per hour. And the next task uh, was to kind of fine tune this more, right? So we got two more requirements, as Tilna mentioned before. The two requirements that we got was to make sure some of the containers should run in isolation, right? So we had some requirements say that, for instance, you know, certain country, uh, we need to run those containers in isolation from the others, right? So that was one of the requirements. The second requirement was the cost sensitivity, means that you need to optimize your cost, right? So those two requirements we were able to achieve uh, by using the task placement strategies and the constraints. So I just want to show you how we use the task placement strategies and the constraints. I, I have given like three examples here, right? three services. And these three services will have different requirements in terms of scalability and uh, reliability. right? So let's take the first uh, service. So the first service will require a high availability and also reliability. And the second service, uh, we would like to, uh, it's a, just a batch mode, uh, batch processing mode, 
but uh, that requires to, uh, we need to optimize the load on the cluster. So that's the requirement for the second service. The third service, which I was talking earlier, which requires some kind of isolation from the other uh, containers. So let's go back and see how we use this uh, placement strategies and constraints uh, to achieve this, right? So I just want to put this diagram. So the diagram shows you, right, on the top you can see the tasks or the containers get auto scale using the policies that you have configured, right? And the bottom you can see the EC2s are getting auto scale, again, using the auto scaling policies that you have. And in the middle, you can see the task placement strategies and the constraints are applied so that the, we, uh, the ECS can decide exactly where the task has to be placed, into the, which uh, EC2 has to be placed, right? Okay, let's go back to the, uh, those example, three examples that I had. First, service one. Service one, you know, if you can remember, it requires uh, high availability which means that uh, we need to have that uh, task across all our availabilities, right, zones. So for that, we use the spaceman strategy called spread, and the attribute here we have specified as availability zone, which means that when the ECS plays in those tasks, it will make sure that it will uh, place all the tasks across all the availability zones that we have in our cluster, right? Uh, but uh, as Sutra mentioned, you can have different attributes, like you can have instance type or instance IDs, depends on your use case. But for us, it's the availability zone. Okay, let's go to the service two. Service two uh, was a uh, batch uh, processing uh, service. So we want to make sure that process runs in a more efficient way, right? So that will kind of uh, goes to our cost optimization. So for that, uh, what we selected was to bin pack on the memory. So with that, ECS will make sure that all this, when they place in the new containers or the new tasks, it will make sure that it will optimize the memory on the cluster, right? And then we get a, a cost benefit out of it. Uh, the task three. So task three requires some kind of isolation. So for that, uh, we, yeah, we, we, what we do is we create a uh, task group, right? And then we, when we are placing the, uh, these containers, we say that, okay, uh, place these containers with this task group. So also when we, are, uh, when we configure the other rules, we can say not to place the, these other containers if there's a, a container that is tagged with this particular task group. Right. It's, okay, so let's move to security. So this, again, a, a big thing on the, uh, these days, right? Security, uh, especially when you're running containers on a cluster. So just want to touch up two things. Uh, one is the container security, and another one is the ECS instance security. ECS instance is basically the EC2, sec the host security, right? Uh, that's a, a term that AWS has. So let's go to the uh, container security. This container security we, know, uh, we control by uh, using IAM policies. We'll make sure that we have, we give only the permission that is required for the others, uh, the, for that container. So you can control all your uh, AWS resource access through the IAM policies. So you don't want to give, like for instance, if the container does not require any elastic cache access, you don't want to specify that, right, in your policy. Just specify what is uh, just the minimum uh, security you need, uh, access you need onto the container. The second point is kind of inherited from our architecture. Uh, as Tilna mentioned, we were, a uh, lot of the inter-service communication is happening through the eventing pattern. Uh, because of that, we don't have a lot of API exposed to between the services. That will reduce our attack footprint. The second point is uh, ACS instance security. So this is important because all these containers will run on these, uh, these EC2s, right? You have to make sure these EC2s are patched and hardened uh, so that there's no any vulnerabilities on the, uh, the cluster. So for this, we use our, uh, we have an automated process we, that we get uh, the latest uh, AWS uh, ECS optimized AMI, and then we apply our own hardening and uh, we install our own security clients on that, and then it will spit out the uh, application specific AMI. So we call this process as our AMI factory. It's automated, and also, uh, AWS has a SNS topic. Even they were they uh, publish a new uh, AMI, they will uh, 
publish a notification to the attention of uh, topic. So we, we kind of subscribe to the topic automatically. Uh, the pipeline will run that, and we'll get the latest AMI. And that's get hooked into our DevOps pipeline. So that's what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, so DevOps and CI CD. So this is, uh, was really critical for us uh, since you know, we have to deliver this within a very short time, right? So we need to get this from the day one. Uh, we, you know, we cannot do uh, DevOps at the end of the development, right? So it has to start with the uh, development when we start this. So the, the base of the, our DevOps pipeline is having two components, main components. One is the Jenkins, and the one is the Terraform. So Jenkins basically does the orchestration of the pipeline, right? Getting everything uh, compiled and downloaded. And the Terraform will take, in, take care of the deployment of the containers to the cluster, as well as the other AWS resources. So just want to walk you through with the, uh, the pipeline, very high level. So you start with, uh, as Uttra mentioned, right? you compile the Docker image. And we have some uh, validation script, which will validate the uh, uh, integrity of these images to whether they are using the correct base uh, Docker image and all the other configuration is correct. And once that's done, it gets uploaded into S3 bucket. And then from there, the Jenkins pipeline will get triggered. And the Jenkins will get the uh, Docker images. Again, it will run some integration uh, test to make sure all the integration tests are passed. And if that is good, it gets uploaded to the ECR, which is the uh, uh, repository for the uh, images. And from there onwards, it will, the Terraform will take over, download those images, and then it gets deployed into the cluster. Right, okay, so next uh, is a monitoring. So we use two components uh, uh, for monitoring of the platform. The first one is New Relic, the second is the Elk stack, right? So New Relic we use to get all the telemetry data of the EC2 instances, containers, as well as the AW pass components, like the SQS, uh, Elastic Ash, and all that. So we get all that telemetry data into a, a dashboard, so we can see you know, in one dashboard everything about the EC2s, the containers, as well as some of the uh, AWS pass components. So for the application login, we use Elk stack. Right, that's a typical um, the Elk's implementation. Uh, but for the log driver, which Uttra mentioned, right, ECS supports many of the log drivers. Uh, we here we are using syslog, which it will stream all the logs of the containers to Logstash, and the Logstash will forward that to the Elasticsearch, and the Kibana we use for the visualization. Uh, since we are not in our containers, we don't store, there's no persistent layer, right? So we don't persist anything on the containers or the EC2s. So everything gets streamed out to Logstash. OK, so finally, I just want to touch up two points that these are the challenges that few of the challenges we had, right, during our, uh, this four month uh, development. The first one was, uh, it was due to, a, we, are get, we were getting out of memory uh, errors uh, of the containers. So this was a known issue between you know, even the Docker uh, and the Linux community. Uh, the issue here is uh, the application runtime which runs inside the container, it's not seeing is the container memory limits. So it will see the host memory limits because, you know, because of that the G, uh, garbage collection is not triggering properly and the result is a out of memory exception. Uh, the, the root cause for this is uh, the C groups are not, I would say, container friendly or containerized. Uh, because of that, the, the application runtime will not see those uh, memory limits, right? Uh, there are a few workarounds to go, work uh, go over this. The one is that if it is Java runtime, you can set the heap size to a certain uh, limit. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, we were running a uh, .NET Core. Uh, we, that version did not have that uh, feature. Uh, but I think the latest .NET Core version uh, have the same feature as the uh, Java heap size. Uh, but at that time, we decided to use this uh, uh, LSCFS uh, file system, which will kind of virtualize all the C groups into the uh, runtime. So the runtime can now see the memory limits uh, which uh, the container has. 
The second is related to a uh, network. Uh, so by default, uh, ECS provide different uh, two, actually now it's three, uh, but initially it was two uh, network modes. One is the bridge, another one is the uh, direct, uh, inter, uh, in direct uh, network uh, connection. So as a default, we are using the bridge network, which means that uh, all the containers are placed behind a Docker bridge. So the Docker bridge gets connected to the host uh, elastic uh, um, interface, uh, network interface. But we had a different requirement from our security group to have to route all our uh, container traffic through a different elastic, uh, like a secondary interface that we have in our host. Uh, but the, the issue here was the Docker bridge was not honoring that routing rule. It was always uh, hardwired to the primary interface of the, uh, the EC2. So because of that, we were not able to uh, uh, give that, uh, uh, make use of that uh, feature. So what we did was we have to do some custom implementation on the Docker bridge to make sure that all the traffic that gets routed to the, uh, the secondary interface. Uh, so th that was a custom implementation that we did at that time. But I think now, a few weeks ago, uh, ECS team have uh, released uh, exactly the solution that we wanted. Right, it's called the uh, AWS VPC, uh, which will allow you to directly bind your uh, Elastic interface to a Docker uh, container or a task. So now you can have one-to-one -one, uh, IP uh, mapping from your task to your network interface, which will give you a lot of uh, capability of, you know, granular capability of uh, controlling your network as well as implementing security on top of that. Okay, just to wrap up, I will hand over to Thilina, just to. Yeah, thanks, Manjeeva. So, um, some final takeaways and uh, thoughts for you guys, right? Um, number one is um, you need good microservices to containerize, right? So, I think that's uh, probably stating the obvious at this point, but uh, having a good microservice strategy will enable scalability, reliability, and good containerization. Once you have a good container, uh, containerization and a microservice strategy, massive scale is really achievable through ECS, right? So a big kudos to the ECS team uh, for making this available out of the box, right? So um, the auto-scaling policies that Manjeeva mentioned, as well as the uh, task placement strategies really helped us um, go achieve this 20,000 TPS within 100 milliseconds uh, for each call, right? And we've tried to break this as well. Um, it, it didn't break, so it was awesome to uh, see. Moving to containers, if you haven't done it, do it. That will simplify your life so much, right? Um, if all the way from development to go to production, right? That's been awesome, right? Uh, and then ECS out of the box uh, capabilities such as ALB integration from day one, right, uh, to ECS really helped us, right? Again, uh, cutting down your development time and um, maybe also um, simplifying things and reducing complexity, right? So these were some of the um, big learnings for us. Uh, big kudos to our development teams and partners as well. Uh, the main development team was based out of uh, Hungary, right? So big kudos for them. And uh, hope you guys enjoyed uh, our learnings um, and the talk in general. We'll be around for another 15 minutes or so. Thank you very much. <laughs>